All right, let's get started. So thank you everyone for joining me today for our Amazon monthly briefing for the month of December 2018. The Amazon monthly briefing is a webcast series that I conduct here uh, for Edge by Essential. And we basically look into Amazon, the recent developments of the past month, and then also do a deep dive on either Amazon uh, tactics or predictions of the sort. Uh, for those of you who have been tuning in throughout the year, thank you. Um, it's been a really enjoyable experience to be delivering these webinars on Amazon to you on, on a monthly basis so far this year. And we're looking forward to continuing it into 2019. Uh, as I said, my name is Jack O'Leary. I'm a senior analyst here at Edge by Essential. And uh, I basically cover all things e-commerce and Amazon is a major component of that. So with that, let's jump right into the, into the webinar here and, and take a look at what we're discussing um, this month. So as per usual, we'll do a recent events recap. I'll go over some of the top headlines and how they are relevant to your business um, since our last time we spoke in, in late November. And then uh, this month, we thought with it being the end of the year that uh, for our kind of deep dive segment of the webcast, we do an Amazon uh, past and future. So basically looking at some of the top developments of 2018 and their relevance for Amazon uh, relevant companies, suppliers, and then also make some predictions for the future. What we see Amazon doing in 2019 and beyond, whether new industry launches or or uh, new product categories or, or, or all the different kind of strategies that uh, Amazon, a very active and uh, important and relevant player might be engaging with going forward. One little bit of housekeeping here. I'm excited to, to, to let everyone know that we actually have an opportunity to um, meet with anyone who wants to attend uh, in, 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 in person, actually. We've got a series of Amazon hackathons coming up. Uh, our first one is on April 16th in New York City. It's an exclusive full day summit with Amazon content, including case studies, our latest perspective on Amazon, and our hack shop masterclass sessions. For anyone who's attended our, our, our hackathons, you may be familiar, but for those of you who are not, these hack shop sessions are uh, breakout topics and they're led by Amazon and e-commerce subject matter experts. And uh, there are small groups, small non-competitive peer groups. And the goal here is for everyone who attends to leave these sessions with measurable improvements to their Amazon strategy and how it can be implemented in their business. Um, we are now selling seats to this event. There are limited seats and early bird tickets are up for sale now. Uh, in the past for our hackathons, we, we sold out twice this past fall. So the tickets do go quickly. So I'd encourage you to definitely reach out to um, your edge partners and, uh, and reserve your seat for the coming year. And then secondly, on May 7th, for uh, any of our clients or otherwise based in, in Europe, uh, we have the same event going on in London uh, with more of a focus on some of the relevant topics to European uh, players and really uh, the same context hack sessions, breakout groups, uh, really helping to improve your business um, around Amazon. So not only can you engage with uh, me and the rest of the Edge team here in a virtual sense, but we look forward to seeing some of you in person at our upcoming hackathon sessions. So with that, let's jump into the content for today's webcast. First, looking at recent events. So I'm looking to kind of frame out some of these headlines and kind of, you know, what's the big strategic implication of, of things that have happened with Amazon to Amazon or strategically from Amazon over the past month. And I think one of the top headlines that has emerged is that Instacart has made a decision to, over the next month, um, slowly ramp down and eventually terminate their relationship with Whole Foods, now owned by Amazon. I feel like this is not a surprise to anyone. This has been a long time coming um, ever since Amazon moved to acquire Whole Foods in 2017. Uh, it's been an interesting process. Instacart, uh, a few years ago, actually in kind of negotiations with Whole Foods, had a contractual agreement to be the sole perishables delivery provider for Whole Foods. Uh, once Amazon acquired Whole Foods and started using their Prime Now rapid delivery system to deliver Whole Foods grocery items from Whole Foods stores around the U.S., it seemed in a pretty obvious violation of that contract. I think our understanding is that uh, Instacart viewed it as, as, as uh, not strategically worthwhile to really challenge on those grounds. This was inevitable that Amazon would start doing this long term. Um, and I think a lot of analysts, myself included, really do believe that 
in some sense, despite Whole Foods being one of Instacart's maybe top customers, uh, Amazon buying Whole Foods and this eventual end of the Instacart Whole Foods relationship probably has benefited Instacart in total. Amazon entering the grocery space in this meaningful way and really identifying it as a key category for them and, and making basically an unprecedented acquisition, acquiring uh, Whole Foods and its 460 stores um, has forced many kind of grocery traditional competitors into the arms of Instacart, uh, maybe prematurely than they would have otherwise. These competitors see Amazon in their category as a distinct threat and are looking to extend their digital capabilities around things like perishable grocery delivery as soon as possible. And Instacart is one of the best partners to enable doing that. So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see kind of as this evolves, the Prime Now uh, Instacart kind of competitive landscape going forward, but uh, no longer will Instacart be delivering out of Whole Foods stores. Uh, looking also in the US and kind of on the supply chain sense, Amazon has launched its second uh, basically owned and designated Prime Air Hub. Amazon has invested heavily in their supply chain capabilities. The, the running commentary from the company is that uh, these investments and everything from a fleet of, uh, of cargo jets, um, a fleet of semi-trailers, uh, and, and these Prime Air Hubs is that it's to supplement, not displace, their supply chain relationships with, with, with the traditional players like uh, the U.S. Postal Service, UPS, and uh, FedEx. But it is interesting to see them building out uh, such extensive Amazon-owned capabilities. So there's now two of these Prime Air hubs. Um, one, the, the one that's been around for a little bit in Cincinnati, and then now the second one is, is in Fort Worth. Um, so it'll be interesting to see you know, how much Amazon looks to bring this type of capability, um, this shipping capability, uh, in-house going forward to kind of control costs. It, it's, it's, a, it's a known headline as of late that Amazon is somewhat um, subject to, you know, their limited uh, partners in terms of what they pay for deliveries. Fulfillment is the most expensive uh, and, and one of the fastest growing cost items for Amazon in their e-commerce business. So I expect this is just the tip of the iceberg. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we get into the prediction section of the webinar. But uh, I think Amazon's going to continue to build out their own capabilities in this space going forward. Now, looking abroad, actually in Germany, uh, Amazon has rolled out a couple of new shopping features that they uh, have been trialing in the United States for a little bit now. The first is the Amazon Scout feature. For those of you who might not be familiar with it, Scout is basically made for you know highly taste relevant categories. Uh, things like apparel or uh, most often kind of home decor. And the idea is it's a simple like-dislike tool and the shopper browses through the items, thumbs upping and thumbs downing things. And the tool through its you know artificial intelligence and understanding of shopper behavior uh, gets more and more tailored to your tastes and preferences and is be be better able to present you with items that you might like. Uh, Scout is really oriented around this, this new initiative at Amazon to enhance its browsing and kind of uh, experiential online shopping. Amazon for a long time has been the best platform for going to find a specific item that you know you want, knowing its competitive price, being able to read reviews, perhaps comparing across a few different um, uh, competitive categories, and then ordering it with high-speed delivery that's highly convenient to you. Where Amazon has perhaps struggled is in shopping trips online that are different than what, what many call that spear fishing type trip that I just described, where shoppers don't necessarily know what they want, are looking to browse, are looking to have you know the closest thing to an experiential online shopping trip as possible. So they're launching tools like Scout to better curate certain categories that shoppers maybe don't know their tastes and are trying to discover items um, going forward. So it's interesting to see that the feature has been rolled out to a, to a new market. So we'll, we'll see if um, any more markets are to come. Generally, the cascading trend is, uh, is, is the US first, then the major European markets, and then elsewhere after that. Secondarily, Amazon has also rolled out their augmented reality tool um, that is a part of their mobile app in Germany as well. This tool just basically helps shoppers uh, visualize items in the home. Uh, they can select the item and it's superimposed onto you know, whatever's in front of them. It's, it's basically a tool to really help shoppers shop categories that are, are a little bit uh, traditionally difficult online. Things like furniture, for example, 
where people really want to touch, feel, and experience the items and, and really maybe see what it looks like. This tool is, is basically to kind of solve that, that shopping trip. So interesting to see this rolled out as well outside the United States and coming to Germany. Also in Germany, and interestingly enough, in kind of the uh, high-speed delivery space, uh, Amazon operates Prime now in Germany, in Berlin and Munich, and uh, a important and relevant uh, drugstore chain there, Rossmann, has chosen to end their relationship with Prime now. So for those of you who maybe are not familiar, uh, Prime now is able to deliver from a wide range of different types of uh, stores that are not Amazon owned in, in many of the cities they operate in around the world. Uh, and had this type of relationship with Rossman delivering, uh, I believe, you know, close to 5,000 items from Rossman store assortments to uh, Prime Now shoppers in under two hours or less in these kind of German urban areas. But I think that competitively, these retailers are seeing the whatever incremental the growth they're getting through the Prime Now program is not uh, beneficial in a competitive sense. Um, Amazon has made it clear it's going after both sales dollars and shopper data um, in a wide range of categories. So I'm interested to see if this will be a trend in markets around the world. Um, to what degree do retailers cooperate with Amazon and Amazon's really amazing uh, shopper programs like Prime Now for the growth and uplift that can bring and to what degree they decide to move away uh, because of the competitive risk of uh, you know, losing shoppers to Amazon, losing the shopper relationship with your brand. Also looking abroad, I think it's interesting, and we'll get into this in the predictions segment of our, of our webcast today, but uh, Amazon new market expansions are always something we, we like to keep an eye on. So this is actually just AWS. AWS is Amazon's cloud computing data storage business. Um, it, it, it supports kind of their retail infrastructure, but it does not, the AWS business as sold to business clients does not have much to do, uh, if at all, with, with Amazon's retail business. Um, but is is an industry leading player in the space and they've expanded to a new hub in Sweden um, it's, it's basically a new AWS facility there uh, This comes as other news has emerged that Amazon owns the uh, Amazon.se uh, URL in Sweden they do not have a retail marketplace there yet and that URL actually uh, redirects the shopper to the German marketplace the Nordic region has been a rumored next launch site for an Amazon marketplace for a long time. So it'll be interesting to see if they extend beyond, you know, launching their, their B2B uh, AWS cloud computing business there and actually build up um, and maybe launch a marketplace there sometime soon. It's, it's definitely a rumored site. The ownership of that URL is indicative of something. So uh, we will be watching closely to see that is probably on the short list of likely regions around the world to get an Amazon marketplace in the near future. Uh, also in Europe, the Amazon Go is going to finally extend outside of the United States after seeing um, uh, some distinct expansion this year. Uh, Oxford Circus section of London is set to get an Amazon Go coming soon. This will be the first Go location outside the United States. Amazon Go, for anyone who might be unfamiliar, is the just walk out checkout list convenience store. Uh, the Amazon shopper comes into the store scanning their Amazon app. Uh, the store has technology using you know, the product packaging, uh, cameras on the shelving to basically monitor everything the shopper is picking up and putting in their basket. And then simply put, the shopper exits the store and is automatically charged to their Amazon account for all the items they took. It's a really convenient shopping experience. Uh, one that Amazon has really oriented around uh, around food. Um, it's there's a lot of kind of grab and go meals, um, uh, kind of meal kits for preparing at home, uh, and then just your general convenience store items. So that will be uh, extended into into Europe. It looks like going forward, and uh, as we'll get into a little bit later in the webcast, is probably going to be launched uh, at even greater scale going forward um, around the world, United States, just in general. Uh, also looking abroad here and in terms of Amazon programs, Amazon Australia, uh, as many of you may know, launched its full marketplace uh, around this time actually last year. And uh, they've slowly rolled on program after program there. Australia is a really difficult market to serve for an e-commerce company due to the basically geographic realities of, 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 of deep, dense population around um, a couple of the Australian cities, mostly on the eastern coast, 
but then vast other areas of shoppers that are really difficult to serve with um, basically Amazon standard convenience expectations around delivery speeds and, and, and things of the like. But Amazon has launched Prime in certain parts of Australia and they've launched FBA, their fulfillment by Amazon program for 3P sellers there. It looks like subscribe and save Amazon's popular program where a shopper can sign up to receive items they consume at a regular basis um, on a regular basis for a discount is going to launch in Australia soon. Um, and for suppliers, subscribe and save is a really great program. If you can identify in your product certain the types of items that really lend themselves well to this, this replenishment system that shoppers find really convenient and shoppers want a discount on, uh, it, it really can drive consistent um, sales growth for, for items that really match it well. So I think um, Australian suppliers that are selling on Amazon that have items in kind of the categories that lend themselves really well to subscribe and save high consumption uh, items um, should be excited about this development because the program is, is, is a valuable one to suppliers in all the markets around the world where subscribe and save currently exists. Uh, also looking abroad, there's an interesting program that I actually don't think has widespread familiarity for, for most. It's called Amazon Spark and it's been in the United States for a little while now. It's, it's the equivalent of a small scale social network that allows for the liking and disliking and sharing of various items and, and your Amazon purchases. The idea is to connect consumers to, to, to one another and, and, and try and build um, a, a social network model, but in the context of kind of product purchasing. And to be honest, the news of this program launching now to a second market launching to India is, is surprising. India is a really valuable market for Amazon in terms of future growth, and they're investing a lot of money there. And I guess it says something to Amazon's belief in this Spark system and what it potentially could be long term uh, that, that Amazon's launching it you know, outside the United States and in India first. So. Uh, it will be interesting to see if, if, if this gets any sort of adoption and uplift, but this program is coming to India in the near future. And then finally, to round out the news, I thought this one was really interesting. Uh, here in the United States, specifically I know in Chicago and maybe some areas as well, Amazon is launching a program known as Amazon Day. And, and the idea of this system is that you pick a day of your, the week where all of your Amazon orders come at once, and uh, it's supposed to be oriented around two areas. The first is uh, preventing, and, and this is very common this time of the year, uh, the security issues, so porch piracy, uh, items getting stolen from people's homes. It's a little bit easier for, for shoppers to make sure that they're there to grab the items and secure them if they all come on a consistent day. And then also uh, sustainability. So the idea that if all of the purchases um, from high consumption Amazon Prime members come on a singular day, maybe you can combine purchases into a singular uh, packaging arrangement and reduce the waste, which is something that Amazon gets a lot of criticism for um, in the press, the uh, amount of packaging waste that, that Amazon orders generate. Now, that second aspiration, it appears with this early trial is not really there yet. The items are still all coming in, you know, the individual boxes or, or packaged in the way that they were going to be, uh, even if they had arrived on different days anyways. But I think long-term as this program gets rolling, Amazon's going to figure out the uh, the fulfillment center systems and packaging systems necessary to to really bring that sustainability sustainability aspect of this uh, in line. So uh, be on the lookout for this program um, extending across the country uh, and and basically shoppers being able to select just another fulfillment option that that might be more convenient to them than than just simply as soon as possible. So with that. Um, let's get into the more kind of strategic, tactical, relevant to supplier aspect of the presentation here. I wanted to reflect on 2018, the key Amazon trends we saw and, and, and how they're relevant to, um, frankly, the, the suppliers who sell on, on the Amazon platform and, and what what's relevant factors are, what suppliers should do and, and what they should look at going forward and then close out with some predictions for Amazon in 2019 and beyond. So I think probably my top story for the year with Amazon was uh, just the robust growth of Amazon and, as an advertising platform, its relevancy. Um, I have an e-marketer uh, study on, on the right side of this slide here. Uh, Amazon is taking share of digital ad spend from the legacy players, Facebook and Google being um, the largest. It is clear that Amazon is, is, is a great platform for, for marketers, for, for, for product uh, manufacturers, because there's that direct kind of 
traceability to actual purchase behavior. Um, and Amazon, because of this kind of reality, has seen really, really robust growth. And there's some predictions that the profit being thrown off of the Amazon advertising arm of the business, which is now um, multi-billions per year, uh, will actually surpass that of the profit that comes from their AWS cloud computing business long term, um, perhaps by 2021. This is important because Amazon's retail business operates at uh, oftentimes near zero or a loss on their income statement, and they rely on other business lines such as AWS and in the future advertising to bring profit back into the total Amazon ecosystem. And because of the maturity of these new arms that keep getting added to Amazon's business, uh, Amazon is now consistently reporting profit. I believe they've had a positive operating income for the last 14 quarters. I think for suppliers, the really relevant points here are it's going to get more competitive. Um, I think it's, it's, it's well known that having evergreen campaigns via uh, AMS and, 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 and interfacing with AMG, um, Amazon's two advertising tools is really important to um, ensuring success of your products on the Amazon platform. But with all of these sales dollars coming into Amazon, it, cost per click is going to go up. Um, it, it, all the metrics, it's just going to get a more expensive and become a more competitive environment to advertise. But nevertheless, one that uh, suppliers need to continue to lean in on and, and really invest there because it's really important to driving sales of their items um, on the Amazon platform long term. Also, interestingly, this Amazon branding of their advertising is, is, is set to change. Amazon advertising is the new brand combining AMS and AMG under a singular umbrella. We'll be interested to see in 2019 if, if, if that changes any of the kind of working relationships uh, advertisers have with Amazon going forward. I think one of the big topics that we've heard from clients in 2018 is 3P selling and many, many big suppliers are considering doing a 3P selling program for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is if their items, Amazon under orders and they have uh, out of stock problems, uh, 3P inventory in Amazon warehouses under FBA can be buffer stock. Uh, some suppliers see 3P as a better way to launch new products on Amazon to kind of test their viability in a less scrutinized environment. Um, also, Amazon tends to not order enough inventory of new product launches, so 3P can be a better option there. Additionally, if they're handling you know, the fulfillment themselves, it's a good way to basically have an excuse to build out home delivery capabilities as a supplier. Uh, additionally, 3P sellers set their own pricing, so there's a pricing influence aspect, and then also uh, potentially the ability to access the margin that would traditionally be reserved to the retailer. Now, what's interesting here, as, as everyone has heard, Amazon is fighting back aggressively against their 1P vendors um, selling 3P. We've heard that it varies a little bit category to category, but Amazon is basically saying under what's going to be rumored to be called a one vendor program that uh, their vendors who are selling a 3P business must cease to do so. Um, it, to this point, we're watching it. Generally, the best in-class strategy is to um, not have the 3P business under the same naming or to use kind of a, a, a third party entity to, to run your 3P business um, if you feel like it's a strategic priority for you for the variety of reasons I have on the screen. Again, the, it, the verdict is still out and what this is going to look like going forward, but hybrid selling seems like it's going to be one of the big battlegrounds uh, in terms of negotiations between uh, Amazon vendor managers and uh, suppliers going into 2019. Profitability continues to be a point of emphasis in supplier Amazon negotiations. Uh, Add-on item thresholds rose several times in 2018. Uh, basically, add-on items are items that Amazon feels they can't deliver because of their low price point at any sort of positive economics, and so they need to be they need to be added on to other orders. Um, Amazon raising the thresholds there basically indicates that uh, that more items just simply can't work in their in their business model. As everyone on the line probably knows, Amazon evaluates each individual item um, unit level economics and crafts items out if they cannot realize a profit on them. So, you know, there, there's, there's, there's thresholds here. The most profitable and the highest sales volume items, Amazon is maybe more likely to do, you know, prime free one day delivery all the way down to items that are reserved for, for, for add-on that, that have the most profitability concerns. I'm sure everyone who spends their time uh, negotiating with Amazon has seen increased and continued pressure um, on, on item profitability. So this is, again, 
going to be an area of, of increased conversation looking into next year. Uh, physical retailing growth is going to continue. Um, you know, the Amazon bookstores is, is a really great shopping experience, one that's really curated and integrates Amazon reviews. Whole Foods um, continues to integrate slowly with Amazon. They've launched Prime Now delivery from a lot of Whole Foods stores around the country. They're also starting to launch Click and Collect from Whole Foods stores. There's Prime member deals. Expect only continued extension of that long term. Uh, the Amazon smaller test formats, such as the Fresh Pickup, I'd be interested to see if you know technology like Fresh Pickup comes to Whole Foods stores and gets tethered there. But I think I want to talk most about the Amazon Go. There's rumors that Amazon wants to have 3,000 Amazon Go locations at some point. It seems like a really high-minded aspiration. There's also rumors that Amazon has worked on the technology and is now likely able to bring it to a larger format store than the, than the under 2,000 square foot Amazon Go's currently are. Uh, Amazon Go locations are rolling out across the United States, and as I said earlier on the call, are coming um, abroad as well, with the first one launching in London. Uh, and there's also rumors that Amazon Go is going to be um, something Amazon positions in airports for really time and convenience-oriented people you know, rushing to their flights. So I think for suppliers here and thinking about Amazon Go, first of all, uh, you have to think about your assortment and its relevancy to the shopper trip type there, really oriented around convenience. Also, Amazon seems to be oriented to these stores around consumables, grab and go meals, meal kits, things of that sort. So uh, really kind of matching that that product assortment and that kind of mission of these stores is, I think, key if you want to have distribution there. And then additionally, we've heard from some suppliers that simply put the technology won't support certain product categories. Uh, so just making sure you're aligned on the packaging needs and the weight needs for the shelves and that the items even have packaging so that the Amazon Go technology can, can work, can basically read the items and, uh, and make the stores function. Uh, Amazon's programs continue to evolve. Um, I think the big takeaway here is Prime Now is, seems like the big vehicle forward for, for perishable delivery across most of the U.S. Amazon Fresh seems to have stagnated somewhat. So uh, we've heard of more Prime Now FCs being equi uh, equipped with uh, refrigeration. Prime Now is now delivering and taking advantage of Whole Foods inventory. Uh, in terms of fresh, Prime Now does seem like the vehicle for it, so it'll be interesting to watch that. And then finally, uh, looking at Alexa, Amazon is seeking to make Alexa the most ubiquitous voice system in the world and basically be able to, to influence all sorts of interactions that shoppers increasingly have with voice. Studies have emerged that uh, Alexa and voice systems haven't really been that relevant to actual commerce and sales, but we see some best-in-class suppliers out there nevertheless leaning in on Alexa and, and, and testing, building capabilities about understanding how consumers interface with voice. So having skills that are oriented around things like education or if you're a consumables brand, you know, recipes or uh, cleaning advice. Basically getting that groundwork and baseline, because if you believe the predictions that are coming out from companies like Google, voice is going to increasingly take share of shopper or consumer digital interactions long term. And so you want to be well positioned as a supplier there because Amazon is making a bet that voice is going to be really relevant and they want to be well positioned as the voice provider long term. And then finally, I think I want to last talk about Amazon's really big expansion into uh, own brands this year. As you can see here, pretty much every category is uh, potentially threatened by Amazon. Looking at the data, understanding the shopper and launching either an exclusive brand through a partner or their own Amazon Basics private label there. Everything from toys to apparel to motor oil, Amazon's in. And uh, they're looking to basically have... Um, highly profitable items. Um, it gives them negotiating leverage with their suppliers in the categories. And this is obviously really threatening to suppliers long-term. Amazon is really predatory with their positioning. Um, as you can see here, Basic Care, Amazon's uh, exclusive brand from a, a manufacturer known as Perigo, is being listed on the product detail page of Advil here, similar from our brands. It's really predatory positioning and Amazon's advantaging their own items. I was actually, we, we pulled a case study from our, um, market share product, formerly known as One Quick Retail, actually looking at the basic care line. So this is interesting. It's Perigo also has um, one of their own brands that is sold on Amazon traditionally. It's not an exclusive Amazon brand. It's known as GoodSense. And then this past year started manufacturing basic care, which is an Amazon exclusive. Amazon gives basic care that predatory positioning I was just showing you on the previous slide. And as you can see here on the week to week uh, sales share chart, 
uh, Basic Care has overcome Perigo's other brand on the platform, its, its competitor, due to that kind of promotional positioning Amazon's giving it. So finally, let's look at Amazon 2019 and beyond, and then I can take some questions. Uh, some predictions for the future. Amazon is going to extend more deeply into healthcare. Um, Amazon made a major acquisition this year for close to a billion dollars of PillPack. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with PillPack, it's a company that's probably one of the most convenient and uh, innovative um, online pharmacies around. They basically take all of your pill and supplement needs uh, they're loaded into the system. They have pharmacy licenses in, I believe, all 50 states. And the items get um, loaded into individual pill packs that you can uh, take every single day. It's really highly convenient. There's also been rumors about Amazon extending into healthcare, offering health insurance. Uh, I just expect to see more um, interfacing between the pill pack system and Amazon.com. Uh, and, and basically, Amazon really go after this really growing uh, segment of consumer spending. Uh, Amazon is always an acquirer um, and always looking for strategically relevant businesses to roll in. So PillPack was an acquisition, but let's think more broadly about potential retailer acquisitions. I'd say Amazon is going to look to acquire any players that they are are in categories that maybe they're, they're, they, they'd like a little bit more relevance in that, that really are relevant to store-based environments. So Whole Foods was the acquisition of 2017, 2019 and beyond. I think they'd look to go after perhaps new shopper segments or new areas of the country where they don't have a physical store presence. Um, you know, some of the top rumors everyone brings up is they've got deep relationships with Kohl's. So Kohl's is a potential acquisition. Um, also orienting them a little bit more around apparel, which is a priority category for them long term. Also outside of retailers, and this brings up my next area, supply chain. Um, Amazon may also look to make acquisitions in this capability area as well. I think the potential of maybe a DHL acquisition is an interesting one. Amazon doesn't currently use DHL as a partner. They use the Postal Service, they use UPS, and then they use um, FedEx. So DHL would actually be incremental um, capacity expansion of their supply chain system. I think also in this area, I was talking a little bit earlier about those prime air hubs. As Amazon continues to extend their own, own supply chain capabilities, what if someday Amazon looks to monetize that for other business models. They already monetize their fulfillment centers through programs like FBA, where they handle uh, fulfillment at prime speeds for sellers. Uh, they already monetize their cloud computing capacity selling AWS. What if long-term they make enough advances in infrastructure and supply chains that they actually look to one, support almost the entirety of their own business, but two, monetize that and sell that um, uh, to, to other companies with distribution needs. Also, in the idea of this kind of retail as a service or Amazon as a as a, a looking for business customers, what if they were to take the Amazon Go technology and license that to other retailers and stores for either a sale, a share of sales, or a fixed upfront fee? But most importantly, the shopper data generated in those stores. Uh, so potentially, white labeling Amazon Go technology is an area they might get into. And then finally, new market launches. I talked a little bit earlier about the Nordic region, Sweden being one. I think uh, Southeast Asia is also an area that Amazon's looking to extend. And right now, Singapore is the extent of, of their you know, operations in Southeast Asia. So we'll be interested to see if they, if they try and target that area, uh, increasingly come into competition with Alibaba there. And then also, they're going to continue to invest in extending their capabilities in different markets. So this past year in Brazil, they finally moved beyond just simply being a digital Kindle store and actually are, are selling a few product categories. It'll be interesting to see you know, what other product categories they launch there. In Mexico, they've started to launch uh, consumable pantry items. Um, what types of programs can they bring to Mexico? Australia, I was talking about a little bit earlier, they launched the subscribe and save program. So look to Amazon to perhaps enter a few new markets um, in the coming years, but also to extend their marketplace and capabilities in the markets they already are in. So with that, I wanted to thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, there is a question and answer tool available to you in the GoToWebinar. I'm going to open it right now. And uh, feel free to reach out to me via, via email. But um, I'll see if I can answer a few questions here. Do you, think, do you think any retailers would be willing to pay Amazon for an Amazon Go white label solution? So it's interesting in how they'd monetize it. And, and, and the way I'm kind of thinking about, we, we're, we're kind of thinking about it is, it would either be uh, a share sales, which I imagine 
most retailers would not be interested in doing or an upfront fee. But the thing that I think would be non-negotiable with Amazon with retail partners is, um, is, is, is owning the data that's generated. So basically they'd have the equivalent of point of sale data because there is no point of sale in, in Amazon Go stores. And that's what's really most important to Amazon. They're gonna be able to understand their consumer and their behavior uh, really deeply basically in this Amazon Go environment with all of the cameras monitoring activities and, and the items that are purchased. I think Amazon's already doing that with some of their physical store extensions, uh, trying to understand their shopper and their shopper's behavior across you know, what they're doing on amazon.com, what they're doing in Whole Foods stores, uh, and just trying to kind of attribute all of that together and, and understand their shopper and really make themselves the most relevant player um, in the future. Let's see what other questions we have. So there was a uh, administrative question. I we will be sharing the deck after the call, so look forward to that. Let's see. Um, there was a question here about Amazon Pay and what we see the future of that being. It's interesting when looking at Amazon Pay and its its offering. It seems to be a kind of a slow moving initiative for Amazon. Uh, to this point, Amazon Pay has mostly been almost like a PayPal solution for online storefronts, um, basically small independent e-commerce players who want to add uh, the ability for shoppers to check out with their Amazon credentials. But uh, on a recent call, we were talking a little bit about Amazon Pay extending into the physical environment. So Amazon has now rolled out capabilities for independent retailers, so small mom and pops, gas stations and um, and restaurants to enable Amazon Pay in, the, in their establishments. And I think, you know, we were talking a little bit about Amazon Go earlier, but I think this is also a bit of a data play as well. Amazon can really understand their shopper behavior in areas that Amazon doesn't necessarily own. And then we'll do one more question, and then I will look to get to all of these via email. Um, let's see here. Is Prime now a crowdsource model. So in the Prime Now system is 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 crowdsourced. Initially, they were using a lot of um, basically third-party uh, companies out there that that already kind of have a crowdsourced infrastructure in place for for doing things like deliveries. Um, but Amazon actually rolled out an inter internal program known as Amazon Flex, and it interfaces with uh, delivery drivers much like. Other crowdsource systems, things like Uber, Lyft, um, uh, Postmates, things of the like. But Amazon Flex is, is an app-based system that uh, allows Amazon to basically run their own delivery infrastructure in a lot of the cities. So at this point, Amazon actually does kind of own the technology and, and the crowdsourcing model that works through Prime Now. I think an interesting area that we're that I'm watching kind of in the supply chain space with Amazon is uh if anyone had seen the headline recently that Amazon's launching this program trying to, they're, they're talking about it in kind of an entrepreneurial way to enable entrepreneurs to launch their own logistics businesses on behalf of Amazon. The idea is Amazon has uh, the tens of thousands of these new Amazon branded delivery vans uh, and they will set up individuals in various parts of the country um, who want to build their own kind of logistics businesses with financing, uh, delivery vans, basically to handle that last mile fulfillment. Um, but the risk is taken on uh, on the entrepreneur and uh, they basically become Amazon's delivery driver across the country. This is a way for them to basically extend their own last mile delivery to more of the country quickly by in involving all of these kind of small business owners potentially long term. Uh, and, you know, it's it's funny. It's it's in a different part of, I guess, what I would call the supply chain value chain than uh, than, than buying you know uh, jumbo jets and tractor trailers, but nevertheless, that last mile is is an expensive part of the ecosystem. And I imagine Amazon gets much better rates from these delivery drivers that they provide the vehicles and financing of their businesses than they do from uh, the postal service or uh, other delivery providers. So with that, um, we are reaching time. I will look to get to all the questions via email. Please feel free. My email is on this slide right here. Reach out to me via email if you have any additional questions. The webinar will be uh, shared after um, via email. Also, please do feel free to look into those hackathon events. Um, they're one of my favorite things that we do. It's really great to, to meet with clients um, in person. And I feel like there's a lot of takeaways and learning that goes on about Amazon there. Uh, so this is our last Amazon briefing of 2018. 
but I look forward to, to, to speaking to many more of you in, in 2019 as, as we continue the series. Thank you.